Great Books for Children, read by Mrs. V. My Side of the Mountain by Jean Craighead George. In which I find out what to do with hunters. That party had a moral ending. Don't feed wild animals. I picked up and counted my walnuts and hickory nuts. I was glad to discover that there was more mess than loss. I decided that I would not only live until spring, but that I still had more nuts than all the squirrels on Gribblies, including flying squirrels. In early November, I was awakened one morning by a shot from a rifle. The hunting season had begun. I had forgotten all about that. To hide from a swarm of hunters was truly going to be a trick. They would be behind every tree and on every hill and dale. They would be shooting that, at everything that moved. And here was I in deerskin pants and dirty brown sweater looking like a deer. I decided, like the animals, to stay holed up the first day of the season. I whittled a fork and finished my rabbit skin winter underwear. I cracked a lot of walnuts. The second day of the hunting season, I stuck my head out of my door and decided my yard was messy. I picked it up so that it looked like a forest floor. The third day of the hunting season, some men came in and camped by the gorge. I tried to steal down the other side of the mountain to the north stream, found another camp of hunters there, and went back to my tree. By the end of the week, both Fr Frightful and I were in need of exercise. Gunshots were still snapping around the mountain. I decided to go see Miss Turner at the library. About an hour later, I wrote this. I got as far as the edge of the hemlock grove when a shot went off practically at my elbow. I didn't have Frightful's Jesses in my hand and she took off at the blast. I climbed a tree. There was a hunter so close to me he could have bitten me, but apparently he was busy watching his deer. I was able to get up into the high branches without being seen. First, I looked around for Frightful. I could see her nowhere. I wanted to whistle for her, but I didn't think I should. I sat still and looked and wondered if she'd go home. I watched the hunter track his deer. The deer was still running. From where I was, I could see it plainly going toward the old Gribbly farm site. Quietly, I climbed higher and watched. Then, of all things, it jumped the stone fence and fell dead. I thought I would stay in the tree until the hunter quartered his kill and dragged it out to the road. Ah, then it occurred to me that he wasn't even going to find that deer. He was going off at an angle, and from what I could see, the, the deer had dropped in a big, ban sorry, big bank of dry ferns and would be hard to find. It got to be nerve-wracking at this point. I could see my new jacket lying in the ferns and the hunter looking for it. I closed my eyes and mentally steered him to the left. Then, good old Frightful, she had winged down the mountain and was sitting in a sapling maple not far from the deer. She saw the man and screamed. He looked in her direction. Heaven knows what he thought she was, but he turned and started toward her. She rustled her wings, climbed into the sky, and disappeared over my head. I did want to whistle to her, but feared for my dear, myself, and her. I hung in the tree and waited about half an hour. Finally, the man gave up his hunt. His friends called, and he went on down the mountain. I went down the tree. In the dry ferns lay a nice young buck. 
I covered it carefully with some of the stones from the fence and more ferns and rushed home. I whistled and down from the top of my own hemlock came frightful. I got a piece of birch bark to write all this on so I wouldn't get too anxious and go for the deer too soon. We will wait until dark to go get our dinner and my new jacket. I am beginning to think I'll have all the deer hide and venison I can use. There must be other lost game on this mountain. I got the deer after dark and I was quite right. Before the season was over, I got two more deer in the same way. However, with the first deer to work on, the rest of the season passed quickly. I had lots of scraping and preparing to do. My complaint was that I did not dare light a fire and cook that wonderful meat. I was afraid of being spotted. I ate smoked venison, nut meats, and hawthorn berries. Hawthorn berries taste a little bit like apples. They are smaller and drier than apples. They also have big seeds in them. The hawthorn bush is easy to tell because it has big, red, shiny thorns on it. Each day the shooting lessened as the hunters left the hills and went home. As they cleared out, Frightful and I were freer and freer to roam. The air temperature now was cold enough to preserve the venison, so I didn't smoke the last two deer. And about two weeks after I heard that first alarming shot, I cut off a beautiful steak, built a bright fire, and when the embers were glowing, I had myself a real dinner. I soaked some dried puff balls in water, and when they were big and moist, I fried them with wild onions and skimpy old wild carrots and stuffed myself until I felt kindly toward all men. I wrote this. November 26. Hunters are excellent friends if used correctly. Don't let them see you, but follow them closely. Preferably use the tops of trees for this purpose, for hunters don't look up. They look down and to the right and left and straight ahead, so if you stay in the trees, you can not only see what they shoot, but where it falls. And if you are extremely careful, you can sometimes get to it before they do and hide it. That's how I got my third deer. I had a little more trouble tanning these hides because the water in my oak stump kept freezing at night. It was getting cold. I began wearing my rabbit fur underwear most of the morning. It was still too warm at noon to keep it on, but it felt good at night. I slept in it until I got my blanket made. I did not scrape the deer, the deer hair off my blanket. I liked it on. Because I had grown, one deer skin wouldn't cover me. I sewed part of another one to it. The third hide I made into a jacket. I just cut a rectangle with hole in it for my head and sewed on straight wide sleeves. I put enormous pockets all over it, using every scrap I had, including the pouches I had made last summer. It looked like a cross between a Russian military blouse and a carpenter's apron, but it was warm, roomy, and I thought handsome.